On va maintenant euh, accueillir quelqu'un de Vice. Alors, je ne sais pas si vous connaissez Vice. Euh, normalement, si vous avez euh, moins de 35 ans, vous connaissez forcément. Plus de 35 ans comme moi, peut-être que vous connaissez, mais c'est un des médias qui cartonne auprès des, auprès des plus jeunes. Euh, et qui en fait fait entre autres des documentaires qui sont vraiment incroyables, d'une qualité euh, exceptionnelle. Et donc c'est un, un de ces médias qui, alors que tous les médias sont en crise, euh, cartonne. Donc on va accueillir en fait le directeur euh, européen euh, de, ce, de, de Vice, qui s'occupe en fait de 18 marchés dans, dans la région, euh, et puis qui a ouvert en fait le bureau de Vice en Angleterre. Il va parler en anglais, comme pas mal des intervenants aujourd'hui. Euh, donc normalement, vous, vous êtes tous super calés en anglais, la langue de l'Internet, la, la langue du réseau des réseaux. Euh, vous êtes tous calés là-dedans. Je vous demande d'accueillir M. Matt Elek. So thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Matt Alec, and I'm the managing director of Vice, um, based out of the UK. Um, and for those who don't know Vice Media, we are a, a youth media company. We've been around for about 20 years. Um, and currently, we specialize in sort of Gen Y demo. And, and we're basically a content company. We, we started in magazine publishing. Uh, we now make a, a ton of visual content, audio visual. Um, we are first movers in online video. And uh, we run a suite of, of digital channels around the world um, dedicated to different areas of interest for young people. Um, and where we found ourselves is, is despite kind of starting out in magazine publishing, um, we became a digital company in the mid 2000s. Um, and for us, it was it, the, our kind of t first 10 years in magazine publishing were interesting because if, if, if anybody's ever worked in independent, Um, publishing, particularly in Canada, you know that it's a, it's a tricky business that you're up against much bigger players with bigger budgets and better distribution. And we learned a lot about content and how to make content that was differentiated and more exciting and, and more relatable to young people. And, and then as we transitioned into digital, um, we kept true to those kind of core principles about how to reach young audiences and how to be differentiated from mainstream. And that's kind of served us very well. So I'll show you a quick video uh, summarizing Vice and, and then jump into a little bit about Um, what I want to talk about is how to reach um, young people through online and particularly through content. Oh no, I've got one more slide, so I don't have them in front of me. So this is just a quick snapshot of, of our reach. So our vice.com, which is our main URL, is about 22 million young people a month. Uh, we have a network of around 250 million young people uh, a month around the world, 500% mobile growth, huge social stats, lots of engagement time on site. So um, I guess what uh, hopefully this kind of demonstrates is in the world of, of digital and content, and particularly when it comes to millennials, Uh, Vice uh, is more or less undisputed as the, as the go-to place uh, for young people and, and content. Shane Smith is here. He is the co-founder and CEO of the international media company Vice. He wants Vice to be the next CNN, the next ESPN, and the next MTV digitally. You've also said you want to be the Time Warner of the street. We already are the Time Warner of the street. Vice magazine, which started in Montreal in 1994, it's become a global empire. You got Vice.com, international network of digital channels, a TV production studio, a record label, an in-house creative services agency. You okay, describe the Vice brand. What is it? Vice is the voice of a generation. The world's first truly global, all digital youth media company. Every day, Vice delivers hours of online original video covering the news, culture and entertainment that defines the world we live in. Everyone was investing platform, 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 money into platform, but no one was saying, well, what are we going to fill that pipe with? Vice is a network of channels, each geared to the passions of young people today. The Creators Project is a visionary celebration cutting edge art and creativity. This is for the globe. <laughs> Noisy is the most exciting, original and inspiring music channel on the web. We got music right in our pocket. Motherboard documents the present and future of science and technology. And Fightland brings you inside MMA, the fastest growing sport in the world. 
Stump is a total immersion into a worldwide phenomenon, electronic dance music. The party goes on. And Munchies is defining a new era in food culture. Real food, real people, real fun. Oh, so good. The newest channel in the growing Vice family is News. Vice News is an honest, immersive, first-person account of a changing world. Vice is opening offices around the globe as fast as traditional news agencies are closing theirs. Our reporters are on the ground, telling the stories that matter most in a language that young people understand and trust. Young people today have been marketed to since they were newborns. They've developed the most sophisticated bull detectors of all time. And the only way to circumvent that bull detector is to not bull. The people who shoot it have to be young. The people who cut it have to be young. The hosts have to be young. So if something is created in a boardroom, it will not work. Vice and the Vice Network, along with new partnerships with YouTube, Facebook and Twitter, are reaching over 200 million young people every month, delivering hundreds of hours of original video and creating unprecedented levels of deep engagement. There's a changing of the guard every generation in media, and we are the changing of the guard for Gen Y. That's a kind of quick story uh, or summary of our, of our media business, and, and hopefully, as I go through some of this, it'll give you some indication of, of why we're, we're kind of well-placed to have a discussion about young people and content and brands. So what's really fueled Vice's business? Um, in particular, this is kind of starting in the mid-2000s, but it feels like every year it accelerates more and more. Um, our trends that are happening in the world for, for young people, particularly around um, online and consumption. So in the last 12 months, 63% of millennials went online more often. They were using mobile apps more often, using mobile websites. And while this is all kind of something that I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of, it's, it's interesting to take a step back and think of the speed with which this change is happening and the speed with which distribution is completely shifting out of a TV model or out of a print model and into something, particularly for young people, where digital um, has become such an incredibly important and influential force in their lives. It is their main point um, of contact with virtually every brand, every friend, every sports team, every, you know, basically everything. And, and Young people have been, and, and I guess in the future will always be the ones to take up these new forms of media faster than anybody else, but when you're talking about um, reaching young people, uh, it doesn't make any sense to basically start a conversation anywhere other than starting with, with digital, and when I say digital, I include mobile and things like that. So for us, it took us about 10 years to get a million readers of our magazine. It took us about 10 years, uh, sorry, 10 months to get a million users onto our websites. And from there, our ability, um, or what we've done, has been able to scale our audience exponentially over the last um, three, four, five years, um, mainly because this is um, not only the way that people are, are consuming, but it's extremely efficient. So what are young people doing online, I guess, is a question. And, and I suppose, uh, in a lot of ways, it's self-evident. But, but primarily, they are, are, primarily, they're downloading, right? So they're downloading content, films, music, TV shows, short video clips, um, social feeds, whatever it is, they are, they are um, bringing content into their lives through their technology. Um, to some extent, they're also uploading, right? So they take pictures of their friends, they make videos of themselves skateboarding, they make their own home videos, they do whatever they want, and they upload it. Um, and then driving all of this is sharing. So uh, social media, and in particular, the, the three big ones, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, are um, sort of key hubs with which information is passed. So um, if you look at the, the ridiculous stats of, and I'm not going to remember off the top of my head, it's, I don't know, 60 hours of content every second or something like that onto YouTube. And, and similarly, however many billions and billions of photo shares and, and Twitter shares, um, the volume of content and the volume of information um, that goes through those sites um, is mind-boggling. And this is kind of fundamentally what drives this. It's a, it's a sort of um, a, an insatiable um, thirst for content, for information, um, and in a lot of ways, it's kind of cut out tons of other media. So um, whereas, you know, you used to have these statistics of young people just sitting in front of the TV and, and just having stuff broadcast at them, it's become a far more immersive and engaged experience where content sits um, incredibly at the heart of that. I mean, fundamentally, what they're downloading is content, what they're uploading is content, what they're sharing is content. Content is the engine of the internet. It is basically what everything, um, what every young person is after. So 
with that in mind and, and sort of bearing in mind the importance of content, what, is this, what does this mean for advertisers and, and why is this relevant and why should you care and why am I here? So while young people, um, and when I talk about millennials, these are people that have basically grown up with, with the internet from the day they were born. So we're talking about people, I don't know, by and large, born in the sort of 80s and, and mostly 90s and 2000s, right? So, so after the days when mobile phones have always existed, more or less, uh, uh, the internet's existed. So they are extremely au fait with how the internet works. And, and they're extremely au fait with how brands market to them. And what that's done is produced a kind of weird dichotomy, which is that um, young people now are actually extremely literate and sophisticated in brands and what brands mean and the value of brands. And, and to that extent, they play a very important role in their lives, right? So the trainers they wear, the films they watch, the bands they go see, the, you know, all of these different brands are cu cultural delineators that um, for young people, rather than in this sort of, you know, if you watched 80s movies, everyone was kind of sell out. You don't associate with a brand. Oh, that band sold out. They did a, a you know, TV show for Coke. Um, that doesn't really exist anymore. You know, brands play a really, really important um, role in people's lives, and, and young people are very accepting of the role that brands should play. What they're not that accepting of is marketing tactics. So because they've grown up with digital marketing tactics for 20 years, or, or in some cases 30 years, um, they're very literate and sophisticated in when they're being marketed to. And that's something that, that, that makes them feel uncomfortable, because when they go on to social media, they're going to interact with their friends, and, and you know, to some extent, uh, nobody likes when you're hanging out with your friends for some guy to come in and go, hey, can you, you, know, can you buy some Coke right now? Um, so where this has led to is, is that there is a role for brands to play, but it's not in hard-hitting marketing tactics of, of you know, just putting banners and pre-rolls. It's around a provision of entertainment. And so what young people are looking for is a way for brands to interact in their, in their lives in a way that provides value, that feels seamless, um, that doesn't feel uh, try-hard in any way. And primarily that's around entertainment, because if we, if we go back to sort of downloading, uploading, sharing, what they're sharing is entertainment. You know, it's, an, it's escapism in the same way that TV is escapism, but now that content is both, you know, in some cases informative and product driven and all that stuff, but largely it's entertainment. And if you look at YouTube, I mean, YouTube is basically a, a reincarnation of television just in a, you know, a slightly different format, but fundamentally you watch TV or you watch YouTube for, um, you know, accepting entertainment and content. And when I talk about content, um, what I'm not talking about is, in particular, native advertising. So this sort of buzzword in media um, is, you know, oh, we'll, we'll just basically, but, you know, native advertising is a word for adver another word for advertorial that, you know, marketing people have made sound like it's a new thing, but it's been around for years and years and years. And it's not about writing, um, you know, a, 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 a sort of puff piece for your brand that you somehow pay enough money that you can slide it into somebody's magazine or into somebody, into Facebook or into YouTube. What content is it is about real entertainment, getting access to a content feed that isn't paid for. So when you make something that's really, really good, when you make something that's entertaining, when you make something that people, you know, laugh and they like, then they share it on Facebook, they share it on YouTube, they like it on YouTube, and then it becomes real content because when your friends say, here's a video I watched, you should watch this too, that's a, that's a, a sort of genuine transaction moment where this ceases to become, it ceases to be advertising and it becomes um, the sort of perfect blend of, of, of real entertainment that people get a lean forward experience where they get engaged, but it still has a product message, it still talks about your brand values. So when you talk about, um, or we talk a lot about at Vice, you know, the, the, the Facebook news feed. So that's the most valuable real estate um, in the world when it comes to media in the, in the same way that, you know, PR is valuable because it's great when, when, you know, CNN says nice things about you. It's far better than having the 30 second spot that's buffered by, by other ads. So when you talk about content, what I'm not talking about is making product pieces or making advertorials or making things that are that are um, entirely focused on your brand. There needs to be a, a middle ground where you can actually get people engaged because you're making stuff that's really good, um, that has a legitimate place in news feeds. Um, and this is part of it. Uh, you know, there is this idea of content, and even when it appears in news feeds, that everything is kind of equal. And um, the thing about the internet is when you go on YouTube, it's you know, the most in incredibly democratic platform in the world. You have um, a ubiquitous amount of content, a ubiquitous amount of inventory, a, to some extent a ubiquitous amount of people consuming it, um, but you have a sort of reality counter in the bottom right-hand corner, which is, you know, how many people watch that video. And, and, and you know, cat videos are very uh, well-received, right? So you, you put up your video about your brand, and you're not just competing with other brands or other content producers, you're competing with family holidays, cat videos, 
dog videos, people getting kicked in the nuts. Everything that is on the internet is your competition all of a sudden. Um, and so what there is is this idea that, you know, I can come to these, these talks and then people go away and they go to their agency like, we should make content, right? Let's go make content. They come back and they're like, here's content. And what it is, is is you need to be better than everything else. So you need to try to talk about making premium content, content that will elevate itself above cat videos, will be more, better received, that have a better message that's more engaging that people will talk about. Um, because when you compete with these things, they're incredibly you know, powerful um, competitors. You know, cats are cute and, and people like them. So you have to make things that are premium. They have to be well thought out and they can't be noise, right? That's the problem. In, in, and it's certainly something, um, you know, when your social media team, you should slap their wrist when they put up something that says something like, you know, hey, it's Friday, who's excited for the weekend? And like, that's, that's not content, that's just, that's noise. And there's a desire on behalf of agencies to produce noise because they get paid for it. But you need to distinguish between what's really good and what's premium and what is just stuff that goes on the internet for the sake of putting things on the internet for the sake of ticking boxes. And part of this is around thinking of content as an art form. And this, this will make, you know, certainly some people in the room uncomfortable um, because when you, when you move out of 30 second spots or, or you know, single page ads or whatever it is, these are, you know, very scripted, very um, meticulously put together pieces of work. When you get into content and you have to start thinking of what's the narrative, what's the, what's the story arc, um, you know, what are, the, what are these real stories? You have to be willing to accept that you are always going to deviate a little bit from what feels comfortable for you. So you cannot, um, or it's extremely difficult to make, you know, a five minute long piece talking about a car that is engaging that just talks about products in the car, right? That's, that's the noise I'm talking about. That doesn't really matter. There is an audience of people who will seek that out, but that's not entertainment. That's, that's a product video. Um, when you get into to making um, storytelling, um, you know, there will be things that, that fall outside of your comfort zone. There will be um, words that are used that you wouldn't normally associate, and it will make you feel uncomfortable because it, it will bump up against your brand values and, in some cases, your brand guidelines and all those things. But, but in order to make things that are really good, you have to be willing to be more risky and to, to, um, to deviate, I guess, from things that you would never deviate to when you create 30-second ads. But, but if you want to create engagement, then you, you cannot just talk about your brand and your brand story because um, even though you immerse yourselves in it 24 hours a day, for those who are casual observers of your brand, it is not you know, particularly that interesting of a story most of the time. Or, or at least if it's a really interesting story, it can be told once or twice, but you cannot create an ongoing suite of content around a brand story that um, you know, is fairly limited. Now, you can use that as a, a jumping point to tell stories that relate to your brand or that always come back to that core message or that, um, or that, you know, create a suite or a feeling or a feeling of sentiment around that core message, but, but deviating from, from the core property is important. The tone of voice um, that you use when you talk to your audience is important, and I, I guess this is, again, is probably a little bit self-evident, but, you know, young people speak in a language that is different to the language that, that most of you speak in and that I speak in, and, and that will always evolve and change over time, right? So um, the vernacular, the, 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 you know, the pacing, the, you know, in, in England, I can certainly, you know, I know the slang and I feel embarrassed to use it sometimes. Um, and that's not to say that you should start speaking in weird, you know, slang talk. I mean, that, that's disingenuous and it's odd. But, but young people, particularly when you talk about social media, I mean, it's a very personal way of communicating. Young people speak to each other in that language. And, and so the way that they consume content, and they're accustomed to having um, a familiar tone and a, and a familiar, um, you know, familiar person on the end of the line. And, and you will never be able to be their friend in an, in an honest sense. I mean, of course not. Um, but you should try to act as a friend does. So um, to be conversational, to be, um, to be a two-way street. It is not simply about you broadcasting your corporate messages at them. It is about, um, you know, trying to create a, an ongoing relationship, trying to create um, a community of advocates around you rather than just an audience. And, and when you create a community that, that interacts with you and that become advocates and they become ambassadors for you, um, it's a far more valuable um, group of people than um, the more traditional way, which is here's an audience of people who have watched our ad versus here's an audience of people that we communicate with on a regular basis and who are advocates and that, that go out in the world and, 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 and talk about our brand in a really positive way. Now, to do all this um, means thinking differently. I mean, this is not something, unfortunately, that you can go to your creative agency or media agency and say, you know, here are the sort of things that, 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 that someone said to me and what do you think and can we make this happen? I mean, you're, um, to, to a large extent, a lot of those agencies are, are 
they, they make extremely good advertising, and I'm not suggesting that advertising is dead or that you don't make TV ads anymore or anything like that. This is a different kettle of fish. And in order to do that, um, you need to start um, applying sort of different rules. And it's about thinking and acting like a media company. When you make content, you know, when you make an ad, you can put it out, you can keep paying to play it for as long as you care to keep paying. Um, and, um, and when it finishes, it finishes. But with, with digital, now we know this as, as first and foremost a media company. We are only as good as the last piece of content we put out five minutes ago. Because people read that and then you know, BuzzFeed comes up on their news feed and they go, oh shit, that's really good, I'm gonna go to that instead. So in order to constantly be enticing them back in your ecosystem, in order to have that ongoing conversation, um, you need to be constantly thinking about what's the next message, what are we trying to say? Now in a way that's terrifying because it's a huge amount of work and it's a different approach and, and rather than having marketing cycles, you're now talking about, oh Jesus, we gotta do this all the time. Um, but it's also incredibly exciting because it means it's a very deep and, and, um, and contextual way of communicating with the audiences. So rather than saying, you know, we have 30 seconds to tell them our whole story, our whole product, here's our price point, then we have to get off the air. This is, you know, you, if you make something that's excellent, and when I say really excellent, you can talk to them for hours. You know, there are, there are um, branded content pieces out there that are five minutes long, 10 minutes long, 60 minutes long. It's all about content excellence. And so um, what you can do in that time is, is you know, is, is, is tell a more rich story or tell a richer story. So you can get into details, you can, you know, you can start to, to all those, you know, when you get into making a marketing campaign, I, I know the work that goes into it, you, the amount of thinking that you know how a brand acts and behaves, but really you only get to tell the audience a very small part of that. What having an ongoing conversation does and thinking about a media company is it gets you, it allows you to tell that whole story. So to make content that, that talks about, you know, your sustainability, it talks about the product, it talks about where it comes from, it talks about your corporate culture, it talks about, you know, it's a very, very rich way of bringing people into your ecosystem. Um, and I've talked about this already a little bit, but it's also about being where they are. So when you make this content, um, I mean, for the most part, you have three, in a digital sense, you know, three main portals, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I mean, these are the go-to destinations, and, and I've seen lots of brands, and they go, well, we'll create our own hub and, and we'll see, and, and, and for a brief period there were brands that created social media sites, which was you know, a, a mostly a terrible failure across the board. But you know, young people are used to consuming content in, in, in specific ways, and in the same way you're like, you know, young people uh, in the 80s used to consume television, you wouldn't go, well, why don't we create a whole new medium of distribution and try to give them our message that way. You're like, look, your audience is in very specific places, they're well-defined, um, and, and it's relatively easy to access in terms of Anthony from Facebook, you can call them up, or YouTube, or Twitter, whoever else, and, and of course, Vice, um, and talk to them about, you know, you have an audience, and it's sizable, and we would like to reach them, and, and have that conversation about how you can get into that content space, um, aside from simply what media can we buy, and what can we put our ads against. Um, and then again, sorry, so this is something we talked about a little bit already, it's about being always on. So when you start that conversation, um, as I said before, the, the good and bad news is it's, once you're on, you are basically on for good. There's no, there's no going back, there's no starting a content conversation, becoming that brand, and then going, actually, we're just gonna go back to TV, because um, young people are kind of expected to, are expecting you to be a part of their lives when they want. Everything is, is on demand, TV is on demand, life is on demand, and so when they log onto the internet at midnight, they wanna be able to, um, to touch your brand and have an experience with you um, as equally as when they log in at lunchtime. So this is about, um, you know, one of the most, Amazing things I've been seeing is the development of newsrooms within brand, and it comes back to what I was talking about, about acting like a media company, where um, I saw Unilever doing it the other day, where they, um, they set up when they launched one of their, their big platforms the other day, a newsroom where it was just instant reaction, anything that went on in the world that was talking about them. A news, when I say a newsroom, it was 20 people with screens all around the world, or sorry, all around the room looking at social media chatter, what's the press saying, what's this saying, and being reactive. Good, good, good. Soon as somebody says something, reacting to it, and 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 it was a really impressive um, way of seeing like when a brand commits to to you know being reactive, being always on, being a media company. Um, it's 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 amazing to see the difference of of that setup versus the difference of you know everyone sits in a boardroom and we agree this is the strategy. Okay, brief the agency and let's see what they come up with in two months. It's a really really different process, um, but you know it can be very successful. It generates huge amounts of audience and. And I'll get to the, the reason of that in a minute. Um, but the last one, and this is maybe the most important one, is about being authentic. So all of these things, the tone of voice, where you, where you um, try and reach them, the type of content you make, all these messages, the, the, they all kind of fall by the wayside um, when you start um, being disingenuous in some way. So coming back to this, one of the things I said at the beginning, young people have been marketed 
too, since they were uh, for newborns, since they were newborns. And so um, they're very literate, they're very sophisticated. Um, they are also um, aware of, of what goes on around them in the world and what goes on around them in the world of brand communications. And so the easiest way to undo all of the hard work that you've done is to lie to them um, because I think it's a fair statement, nobody likes being lied to. And so um, when you um, go to somebody and you tell them something's not true, it, it's the, the, the quickest and easiest way of destroying all the brand credibility you've built up. Because the minute they go, well, they lied to me about that, then you go, well, what else are they lying about? And, and what else of this is all just total bullshit? So um, what you need to be very mindful of in your agencies is when you make something, let it be true. Um, don't create brand stories that, that, that are inauthentic. Um, don't talk to people in a way that, that um, you know, when I say about talking to people in the right vernacular, I mean, I'm not saying it's not slang. It's not, it's not trying to be something you're not. Um, just be casual. Um, but always try and be... You know, be real. And what does all of this do? So this is, um, it can shift um, a lot of the models in terms of advertising. So when you talk about, um, let's say Unilever or Oreo during the, the Super Bowl of, of these newsrooms, you know, that's an expense and shit. we already have a bunch of expensive agencies. But what this does is it, is it doesn't necessarily replace any of those agencies, but it certainly can shift your model from um, you brief your agency, you get a uh, a 30 second spot and, and some surrounding um, content and then you spend 90% of your money getting people to watch it. When you make really good content, you can reduce your advertising spend on above the line because um, when young people like your content, when they accept your content and fundamentally when they share your content, when Twitter and Facebook and YouTube kick into action and you get, you know, the video counter starts going, you know, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 70 million, um, what you're basically getting is free media, and not only is it free in that you haven't paid in order to get it, but it's also um, free and, and exciting in the sense that when uh, I, you know, tell my friend, here, you watch this video, that is a far more effective marketing tool, um, it's far more authentic, it's far more credible than, you know, you sit in front of the TV and you go make a cup of tea while your ad comes on. So um, it's not just because it's a way of reaching them uh, and reaching young people because that's the way they consume, it's a way of reaching them because it's efficient, it's a, it's, a, it's a good way of spending money and it's, a, it, it's, a, um, it's an effective marketing tool. And for young people, uh, it's also going to become um, a necessity. I mean, when young people are no longer watching TV and they're not reading magazines, you don't really have a choice, right? You have to get into that content space because otherwise you simply don't have a means of reaching them. So that's pretty much it, but I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna show one um, case study just to finish off, which is some work that Vice does with Intel. Um, and we've been doing this project called Creators Project with Intel for um, four or five years now. And, and basically, Intel came to us in, in 2009, I believe it was, with a sort of business problem of young people are, are more or less disengaged with Intel. They don't really understand our brand. In most cases, they don't even really understand what Intel does as a business. They don't know what microprocessors are or why they should care. And so we came up with a content-based um, initiative that's been running for a number of years now around contextualizing Intel as the piece of magic or the piece of technology that makes everything good and great in the world come to life. And, and, and at its core, this content is, is around um, every, everything that we produce or we shine a light on, all the content we create is, um, has an Intel microprocessor um, at the core of the story. And so what we've created is um, a platform, an ongoing event series, um, a social media project, a YouTube channel, a really rich, um, content experience that's been hugely successful for Intel. Um, it's won virtually every advertising award in the world at this stage. Um, and, and just to kind of summarize, I guess, a lot of the points that I made, um, this is, you know, as I guess we would say, um, but this is what we would consider to be the gold standard of this type of content marketing. The Creators Project is an ongoing global celebration of art and technology. Founded by a revolutionary partnership between Intel and Vice, the Creators Project supports visionary artists across disciplines who are using technology in innovative ways to push the bounds of creative expression. Our goal from the start has been to increase Intel's brand relevance among young people. Now in its fourth year, this revolutionary platform includes an online community of millions, an online media channel that distributes original documentaries and artworks, and an initiative that supports the production of new works. This album was a journey. I'm doing things nowadays that I could have never done 10 years ago. 
We kicked off the year with a two-day festival in San Francisco to continue our global event series. We then made our way to Paris, Sao Paulo, Beijing, and Seoul, where we set a new record of 720,000 attendees. Major new initiatives this year include the launch of a new digital art series, featuring new music videos, web-based interactive films and art projects, a groundbreaking Facebook 3D printing initiative, and deep-reaching collaborations between Intel Labs and numerous high-profile artists in the program. I can do anything I want, and I have no boundaries of where I want to take my sound. 2012 also saw the launch of the Creators Project original YouTube channel, which is growing to be the premier home for discovering emerging artists, seeing original works, and exploring different sides of favorites. I think the technology was super instrumental in my understanding of art. The project now has a total of 230 million video views. We have also built a stronger, more committed audience, with 1.7 million people visiting the site nine times or more in the past year. Through the Creators Project, Intel and Vice are creating true cultural moments and redefining the way the youth of the world interact with art and technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, Est-ce qu'on a des questions Vous pouvez poser vos questions en français et je les traduis en anglais si jamais. Yes, hello. Thank you for your presentation. I had the impression that young people were moving out of YouTube, Facebook and Twitter from uh, the teenagers with whom I interact. And uh, what would be the newest trends and where are they going next? In terms of platform trends? Uh, I mean, I, I would... I would argue that um, those kind of prophecies that Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are dying are, are off the mark and just incorrect. I mean, the numbers, um, the numbers just don't back up that story. YouTube is still growing, Facebook is still growing, Twitter is still growing, and, and I think um, because there have been successful IPOs, because they've been around for a while, people would love for Facebook to fail and YouTube to fail and all these things to fail, but the reality is they're not. I mean, they're just, they're so dominant and they're so big and they're not going anywhere. And there will undoubtedly be new things that come. Um, and I suppose Instagram is maybe one that you might start to include in that list of three and maybe it's four now. Um, and, but for young people, I mean, I think LinkedIn for, for maybe a slightly older consumer. But it's still completely dominated by Facebook and YouTube in particular and by Twitter and maybe, maybe Instagram as well now. Yeah, there are stories in the media right now that say that yeah, teenagers don't use Facebook, but what the stories don't say is that when the teenagers grow, they start using Facebook. It's a bit like email, like you don't use email when you're 15, but then you get a job and then nobody asks you if you want an email because you get an email and you have to use it. So this, this, the, the reports of the deaths of these medias are uh, overrated. Um, I had lots of questions actually. Um, when you, you showed your, med your media mix. Uh, why do you still keep 2% of paid media? What do you do with these 2%? So sometimes, uh, when you, when you, I mean, when you release a great piece of content, um, there, there is a misconception sometimes. It's like when a, when a client, and, and I've seen it, they go to an agency and they're like, make me a viral. And they're like, look, you, virals happen, right? Of course they do, but they're pretty rare. Um, there are millions of virals made every year, and probably, what, 100 of them actually become real viral sensations. So in order to get things started, it's not to say there's no role for paid media. Um, for instance, we run a program with Facebook called Anthology where we, we work with brands to make sticky, engaging content for young people. And then we, we have a media mix with Facebook where they do targeted uh, media to, to f ignite those fires, right? It's helpful to have a sort of initial spark to get people consuming. And once they consume, then they share. But um, it's, it's maybe a little too hopeful to think you make good content, you put it on Facebook and it just works. I mean, you do need to have some paid media. but. But it's not 90% of your budget. Maybe it's five or 10 or, or whatever number you're comfortable with. But, um, but it, yeah, it, it, there is a, a requirement of paid media to some extent. And so you mentioned this native advertising format, which is the big trend right now in media. Everybody's talking about that. And there are a lot of diverging opinions. Some people say it's the future of media. Some people say every time you do something like that, it's a bit of your trust that you give away. And then at one point, people lose trust with your media and stop coming. What do you think of this balance between doing these native media formats where you kind of mix your brand with some advertising and trust? How do you well, address I, this balance? I th it, it, you need to distinguish, I guess, between, 
I guess, pure native advertising, which effectively is an advertorial, right? So, you know, I was reading a magazine on the plane on the way here, and it's like, you know, three pages talking about a ski resort in Switzerland, and it says advertorial at the top, and, and in most media now, because of regulation, it will say paid for. So there's no difference. I mean, it's just an advertorial. And, and yeah, from the, the, the problem is actually less to do with advertisers. I mean, it's probably a waste of money because it's not that credible. It's more for media because, yeah, the more advertorials you run, the less valuable your media is because you're just an ad. But, it's, um, but, it, it, but it demands a change from the advertiser, is that they become contributors and they have to learn to create real value for people. But at that stage, it, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessarily um, native advertising. And I guess there's a blurred line here. But when you get into making really good content, um, and then you release that in a genuine sense, then people pick it up and they will run. So for instance, like Creators Project, we, uh, we have a TV show on CCTV in China called Creators Project TV, which is not something that we pay for. It's Chinese television going, we think this content is amazing. Could we cut this into a number of half hour segments and run it on our channel? At that stage, it's not native advertising and it doesn't need sponsored because you haven't sponsored it. It was really good content that you made that the audience has a thirst for and that has a real home in the world of media. So native advertising or, or the idea of, of paid for placements of content implies that the content you've made isn't good enough to legitimately sit within media. When you make content that is really good and has a legitimate place in media, it ceases to be native advertising and it's just really good content. Now my point is that it demands a certain mindset from the advertisers that most of them still don't have. And yeah, the, there are the, a few like, smart advertisers that understand that it's fine, for example, for some to be criticized. Uh, it's fine that there is comments below the story that say bad things about them. So not all advertisers can do that. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. And you know, for sure, in every conversation virtually we have with brands, you know, it's, can we get a little bit more of our logo in the shot? You know, I'd like to see the car more in this film. And look, it's a toing and froing between us and the advertiser to say, look, for every, every additional car shot you put in, you lose 1% of that audience, right? So um, there's never a right or wrong answer. I mean, from our side, of course, the, the less branded we can be, the, more, the, the better it's going to perform. But it doesn't always tick all the right boxes. So that's a, just a, a, a debate that happens when we make this stuff. Any other question? So yeah. what's the type of copyright you are using on your different channels? Does, do, does the, the, the rights management you use allow people to like, take the media, remix it, re-upload it? Uh, for the most part, yeah. I mean, y when you're making audiovisual content, you have to be in line with legal regulations. Has to be, all your music has to be cleared. All your, anybody who appears on camera needs to sign release forms. I mean, it's, it's basically TV regulation. There's no getting around that. So when we, meet, when we make something, whether or not it's for a brand or for us, you have to clear all the rights in the identical way you would if you were making but it. But what happens if someone downloads a video from YouTube and re-uploads re it to their account? Are you guys like doing this content ID thing? And well, we'd be the same as anybody else. So YouTube is, is pretty efficient at if you flag a copyright infringement, they block the video. Um, and that's something that we have to do with our own content. So for instance, we make a show for HBO called Vice that's geo-blocked in lots of countries. and on a regular basis, someone will film that, upload it onto the British YouTube where it's blocked, and then we have to call YouTube, then they block it. I mean, it's, there's, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet for these things. It is, you know, you just have to sort of approach it as you would with any type of copyright. Um, but in a lot of ways, it sounds a lot more complicated than it is making sure that things are cleared. When you talk about downloading, I mean, for the most part, YouTube is streaming. I mean, there's a relatively easy way of ripping things off of YouTube, but that's the same for anything, right? Anybody can go to the cinema and film a, a, what's on the screen, and you, you can't legislate for that. It just happens, and you have to combat it in, in the regular ways. Does that answer your question? Not really? You, you guys can have a discussion about that after. I had a question. When I'm thinking about brands that do produce a lot of content, the one brand that comes up, and I think it's the same for everybody, is Red Bull. And I'm jumping on, on one remark you were just saying a second ago is advertorial. And it seems to me like what Red Bull is doing is like advertorial because they produce content. They have a um, editorial line about extreme sports and it's Red Bull all over the place. So my question is, what's your opinion on it? And do you think that it's 
that strategy and that this content production that does sell their products at the end? Um, I mean, I think with, I mean Red Bull is is the the number one example that everybody would bring up, and I you know mostly agree with it that that, that they do a really good job of making content and and. I think the most impressive thing they did was make that decision 10 years ago and stick to it and stick to it and stick to it and never deviate and and um, and I think it's been very successful. So when you watch like the Red Bull Air Race on TV, um, which I believe is 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 not paid for, even though it's filled with Red Bull logos and it's filled with Red Bull, it doesn't really matter because people still want to see airplanes racing through London and so. Um, it's okay, like you don't have to, just because you're making content, it doesn't mean you can't have your logo in it and talk about your brand and talk about your product, but it just can't be, that can't be the focus. The focus needs to be, in this case, an air race or, um, you know, or whatever else, a ski race or, or jumping, you know, motorbikes or, or the best one is, is the one where he jumped out of the, the balloon, right? So um, everybody knew it was a Red Bull thing. There was a Red Bull all over him and yet, tens and tens of millions of people watching to watch it because it was a phenomenal moment. So, so don't mistake, it maybe comes back to one of the first things I said, young people don't dislike brands. They're not, they're not gonna not watch something because there's a bunch of Red Bull logos in it. They, they just, they, it needs to be good enough for them to watch it, for them to, to sort of, um, it needs to be engaging. But the, the, the role of the brand is fine. It just can't be um, watch you know, this guy jumping out of a balloon, and then when they go to watch it, we're like, it's not really a balloon, and actually we just staged it. But here, why don't we tell you a bit about our product instead? It's that, that's the jump. As long as the content's good, the brand is fine. If the content is bad and the brand's there, then you're in trouble. So it, in a way, the more I was listening to your presentation, what is interesting is that you guys seem to be kind of a new generation media, but at the same time, you have to stick to fundamentals that haven't changed, which is good content, right? The world of media has changed a lot, but in many ways, it hasn't changed. Well, that, that was something that, that Shane talks about in our video. Um, yeah, everybody, there's all of this um, platform development, right? Facebook and YouTube and Twitter in particular are, um, have you know, really revolutionized distribution. Um, but that's what they've done. They've revolutionized the distribution of content. They haven't revolutionized content. A good story is a good story. And this is the reason people are so drawn to good stories is this is a fundamental truth of human life that goes back millennia where people have shared stories since the beginning of time. So yeah, good content is good storytelling. And that's, that will never change, I don't think. Yeah. Just a quick one. Hello, Matt. Um, there is a web filter here um, that prevents us from accessing to vice.com. <laughs> and it says, um, your content is categorized as adult slash mature content, so it's a bit of a contradiction for. Yeah, we had uh, we have a we have a problem. Actually, it's a live one because our name is Vice. Um, it's a it's a, a blessing and a curse that sometimes we get blocked by filters. Um, but I assure you, it is not a uh, adult or or a pornographic website. Do you have a, a secret URL? Do you have a white URL that people can use? No, we actually we have you teams have of synonyms. people who, when, whenever we get flagged on a on a ad, on a site blocker, we then have to contact them and go through the rigmarole. Yeah. But okay. uh, which traditional media, you know, if we put this like weird line between new and old media, but which old media is doing okay according to you these days? And what the fuck happened to MTV? Uh, I'll start, maybe I'll start with MTV because that's an easier question. I mean, MTV, uh, I think to some extent with young people, they have their life cycles and MTV, I mean, MTV are not, um, their profile amongst the audience is very poor, but actually as a business, I think they're actually doing not so bad as my understanding. Um, but, you know, fundamentally their problem is they're in the wrong medium, right? So their, their core business is based on television. Young people don't want te watch television as much anymore. Um, well, you know, right. it's no big surprise that they've struggled. Um, so that I think is the wrong medium, and then also there's a generational shift. MTV is is my dad's. I'm not me. I'm kind of slightly too old. But if you're 18 right now, that's maybe that's my dad's generation. That's something that that I've heard about in Dire Straits songs, but it doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, you know, my medium is 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 Facebook, or it's or we would like to think it's Vice, and these are brands that that stand for a culture. And I think it's it's a bit weird. MTV was so cultural and it was so big and so important that when you get that big and important, you, gen you, you necessarily kind of have a, a life cycle because... Yeah, it's the innovator's dilemma. It's, uh, you kill yourself because you stop listening and you become yeah. arrogant and you, 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 you cannot reinvent yourself. So in your eyes, are there any like, traditional media like the New York Times? or Do you see somebody who's doing something interesting? We're talking to the investors in the room here who want to buy media stocks. Uh, 
I mean, in terms of, of, of media, I mean, the, the, the one that I, and I'm, I live in England, so, I mean, the BBC are consistent. I mean, they have an endless amount of money to throw at problems, but, you know, the way that they've tackled on-demand television, you know, their mobile stuff, their, um, their proliferation of digital channels, I mean, they, you know, when you have that much money, it's easy to, to fix those problems, but they clearly do a very good job. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's some of the bigger um, media channels that are clearly struggling, and I guess the New York Times relaunched their website the other day, but, you know, I, I worry for someone like the New York Times that even though they're such an important source of journalism and information, a, a website redesign doesn't fix their fundamental problem, you know, so um, I think a lot of those big companies are burdened with, um, with legacy issues that are not hard to, or that sort of that are extremely hard to get rid of, right? They have huge pension issues. They have, you know, these massive TV studios filled with expensive equipment, and it's kind of hard to go. Well, let's throw it all out and buy, uh, you know, five Ds and 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 desktop software, and we can just do this better and cheaper. And that's a lot. A lot of the the new content creators are so efficient and able to make money in the digital space because our cost per hour of content is a fraction of what. Channel 4s is or the BBC because they they just they invested in all this equipment and it's a big overhaul to go let's get rid of all of our expensive journalists and all of our expensive kit and let's start with younger cheaper better editors with cheaper equipment and that's a tricky one yeah yet the, the quality of your images and of your content is stunning as we've seen we can get yeah we, yeah we can shoot an hour of HD content with equal editing to the BBC okay. for less than 10% of so what the cost one final have. question like how does a media like Vice get old how, I mean your audiences are getting older. What, what, what happens, like people exit the Vice ecosystem because it's not longer relevant because they got older and then you renew with your younger people or you guys are gonna follow your audience and get older with them? I mean, part, eventually people will, will leave our ecosystem. I mean, I think that's inevitable. What we've been trying to do and what we have been doing is launching new channels. So we started with Vice.com, that was our one and only brand for a long time. And then what we've done is launched a suite of channels um, dedicated to different areas of interest. So we bought um, a fashion company last year called ID. We launched uh, a noisy, a music channel. As you saw in there, we're launching Vice News um, is coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, technology, sports, et cetera. So